One day I went to uh, lunch with Bob Johnson and I was helping him with the cable franchise and we had a break in the city council hearing and he said, Deborah, you want to have lunch? We went to lunch and he offered me a job as general wow. counsel at BET. So I got my dream job because I love the fact that it was a black owned company. I love the fact that they were creating uh, programming for African Americans and it was still in DC. Welcome to Securing the Bag, the Roots exclusive series focused on work, entrepreneurship, and the secrets to success. We have a wonderful guest today, Deborah Lee. Deborah Lee, we all know, was the former CEO of Black Entertainment Television. So how does a young girl growing up in a small town, military dad, go from Greensboro, North Carolina, to Brown University, to Harvard, to New York, and to owning the world. I mean, <laughs> how did you well, learn I don't to think I ever thing? owned the world, <laughs> but thank you. The short answer to that is my dad. Uh, we traveled the world, he was in the army. Mm -hmm. So I was born in South Carolina, Fort Jackson. Moved to Germany when I was six months old. And then uh, we moved all around. And by the time he retired is about the time we moved to Greensboro, North Carolina. And all of a sudden I was in the segregated South. I didn't think of Greensboro as a small town. We had four high schools and four malls. So I thought <laughs> it wasn't until I went to college that people started commenting on my small town. But my dad always wanted me to go to Ivy League school. He was from Washington, D.C. and his sister, my aunt, went to Mount Holyoke in the 40s. So he knew those kind of educational opportunities were out there and he wanted me to take advantage of them. I was born the year Brown versus Board of Education wow. was decided. So I was part of that new generation that was, you know, able to select any college we wanted to go to. And he very much wanted me to go to an Ivy League. So I picked Brown. Then when it was time to, to apply for law schools, I wanted to go to California because I had a boyfriend in California. Okay. Oh, and then my dean said, you didn't apply to Harvard or Yale. And I said, I don't want to go to Harvard or Yale. And he said, well, you have a really good record. You should apply to at least one of them. And I left his office in tears because I knew if I applied to Harvard um, and was accepted, my dad would make me go. So I applied to Harvard, but then I didn't tell my dad <laughs> until I made up my own mind. I got accepted and I said, you know, I should really go to Harvard. Why not? <laughs> and uh, when I told my dad, he said, oh, but you didn't even apply. <laughs> so that was what it was like growing up with my father. He wanted, the, I was the youngest child who wanted the best for me and he always pushed me. So could you just tell me just a little bit more, what, what was that specific thing do you think that your parents did early on that helped you become this purposeful, successful person? person today, or student, like right. what did they do early on? And I, I mean learning. Well, the first thing I remember is my dad gave me a dollar for every A I brought home. Oh, wow. So that was a big incentive, because <laughs> I wanted the money. Of course. That was uh, one thing he did, and kind of laying the foundation for how important education was. My mother was almost completely different than my dad. She was very creative. She could sew, crochet, knit, she Do taught you those things. She I taught me all of them. How about reading? A lot of parents taught their kids right. to read early. Yeah, uh, I don't remember who taught me to read, but I remember my dad encouraged me to read. Before Christmas, he would always give me the New York Times oh, wow. children's book mm -hmm. edition, mm -hmm. and he'd say, circle anything you want, wow. and I'll get it for Christmas. So part of my Christmas every year were the books I wanted. Wow. And I like to sit in my bedroom and read. Speaking of books, <laughs> we'll get to your book. This is a fascinating book. Oh, thank there you. There was a lot of juice in here. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good stuff, a lot yeah. of good stuff. So let's, let me ask you, how long did it take you to write the book? It took me over two years, wow. but it was a slow, methodical process. And um, I had um, time at home because yeah. of COVID. Yes, yes. That kept me off planes for for two years wow. or longer. So I was able to really focus and get this book done. And let me tell you, I'm so proud of it. it it's a great read. Yeah. It's a really great read. I just kept, you know, just I couldn't stop reading. Yeah. Now there's a lot of um, interesting things in here. Yeah. Now, I, one thing that you've done <laughs> is brought some really good TV for black folks. Thank you. My favorite, one of my favorites being Mary Jane. And, you, <laughs> and of course, the game. game yes. You have to tell us how you were the ones 
the one to get these two shows. Can you give right. us a little um, um, idea of how that happened? Yeah, well, the game was a show on the CW. Mm -hmm. They took it off. Their average ratings were uh, a million point five mm -hmm. a week. They never promoted the show. Wow. And when they, we had already bought the rights to the syndicated product, which is the product they had already shown. Right. So those episodes did well on BET. When they canceled it, our viewers started a letter writing campaign. Email wasn't popular back then, but they started a letter writing campaign asking us to bring back the game. Wow. And so my programming folks started negotiating with CBS. They were the production company and they wouldn't let us have it. And they were part of our family. We were part of Viacom and they were scared that we wouldn't bring the same quality to it. They just wouldn't do it. And they were wrong. <laughs> After two years of negotiation, they finally let us have it. Wow. There was no difference in the quality. I mean, we had the same writers, the same producers, the same stars, and we put it on after it had been off the air for two years. And the first night it got 7.7 .7 million wow. viewers, which wow. was more viewers than um, any other um, original sitcom on cable. And uh, the, the crew, the talent, the creator, Mara Brocka Keel and her husband were all thrilled. They were happy to be on BET, we promoted it, and the show was a big success. Being Mary Jane was also created by Mara Brocka Keel. Yes. And she and Salim, her husband, brought it to me, and I read the pilot, and then I met with them in a conference room at BET, and it was the first show I greenlit in the room. I mean, I was just so uh, impressed with the pilot. She was a feisty, professional woman, current, you know. With what a beautiful you, home. With I a, love that home. <laughs> oh my God, I love that home. That I was a that real home, home in oh Atlanta. My goodness. And then the second year, the owners wouldn't let us use it again, so we had to recreate it. I, yeah, so but, <laughs> it moved, I remember. <laughs> But anyway, and then they were able to uh, get Gabrielle Union to play the lead part. It was really uh, wonderful. You know, she had she was a successful one in her family. I related to that. She had uh, uh, two brothers, one who was selling drugs and one yes. who was yes. had an addiction problem. And we showed, you know, her trying to help them. I mean, we always wanted BET programming to be authentic. It was very, and I want to I say this, I really say this in a loving way. It was very black in, in, yeah. in a very good way. Right. You know, it was very black. But it wasn't all black. Not all black. Her but it producer was, was Hispanic. Course. The network head was yes. white. But there was just something authentic, very yes. authentic about it. You know, it didn't matter. She had loads of money. She, right. um, the, the, the protagonist was rich. She's right. beautiful. She's successful. And she was yet very, very, you know, black. And, and she had a lot of sexy she had relationships. All oh, the shower scene, the famous <laughs> shower scene. We won't even go into that. You talk a lot about um, how hard it is to mm -hmm. break the, um, the glass ceiling. Can you talk to us about a failure that happened, a true failure that became a success? A lot of young people believe, you know, they fail and they think that's it. Mm -hmm. But actually, I believe a failure is just a journey to right. success. Yeah, I'll give you two examples. Uh, they're both before BET. One is when I graduated from law school, I clerked for a year. I took the bar the summer before I started uh, clerking. I clerked for a really tough judge named Barrington Parker. And he would call you in and he would drill you on you know, the cases you read and what this opinion should say. Well, anyway, I found out during that clerkship, I had failed the bar. Oh my God, I was so embarrassed. My dad was mad. My mom gave me a hug. I always say that's the <laughs> difference between my dad and mom. He was just like, how could you fail? And she was like, oh honey, it's okay. And so I had to tell the judge, which was really tough. He was tougher than my dad. Mm -hmm. And so when I told him, he said, oh Deborah, come around the desk. And he had this huge desk. And he said, hold my hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I held his hand and he said, Deborah, this is the first failure that you've had. You're gonna have a lot more failures and you're gonna be okay. Wow. And after that, That's I decided, yeah, I decided to appeal um, the decision on my oh. bar exam, which you can do in DC. Oh, and they, no. they give you your little blue books back <sighs> and you argue why you were right. And I think that process was more like being an attorney yes. than writing the things in the first place. I don't know how many points I needed, but I wow. passed on appeal. Are and you serious? I'm so serious. That's and if story. I had to take that bar again, 
I probably wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't be an attorney to this day because it was so much work. You know, you had to study all summer. So luckily I didn't have to take it again. So that's one story. The other story, I went to a big law firm because I didn't want to go into a, a Republican administration mm -hmm. and Ronald Reagan had won while I was clerking. And at the law firm, uh, I was planning on leaving when the mm -hmm. Democrats came back, but that took 12 years. After five years, I said, okay, I got to go. I, this is not what I wanted to do. Um, and up until that time, the fifth year is when they really consider you for partner. I was getting ones. Uh, every year, when you had a review, mm -hmm. they give you a one, two, or a three. I had gotten all ones until my fifth year, and then all of a sudden I got a three. And I was like, what happened? I'm doing the same work. You know, how'd I go from a one to a three? So a one was great. Great. You, and a three was, was not great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one was, you're probably going to make partner. And a three wow. was, yeah, you're, you're probably not going to do, unless you do something different. So I went and talked to who I thought was my mentor. And he was like, well, you know, I don't know what happened. I wasn't in the room mm -hmm. when they had this discussion. I was like, what do you mean you weren't in the room? And long story short, he didn't go to bat for me. Right. And I was doing mostly communications, which were smaller projects. And so there's no one in the room to go to bat for me. It's a good lesson. Right. And so that's when I said, I really need to leave the firm. This is not what I want to do anyway. And, you know, I'm getting mixed signals. And that's when I started looking for a job. And what came out of that? BET. Wow. <laughs> that's a big lesson. And BET was a client. And one day I went to uh, lunch with Bob Johnson and I was helping him with the cable franchise and we had a break in the city council hearing and he said, Deborah, you want to have lunch? We went to lunch and he offered me a job as general wow. counsel at BET. So I got my dream job because I love the fact that it was a black owned company. I love the fact that they were creating uh, programming for African Americans, and it was still in D.C. I and didn't you got even... it because you failed, and you kept going. Last question, last question I gotta ask you. One secret to your success, just one secret. You know, I would like to say one of the secrets, maybe the biggest one, is I have a great sense of humor. A great sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't let things get me down. I mean, there have been dark times, there have been things I wish had gone other ways, but my thing is, if you can't have fun at work, where can you have fun? That's a good point. And you spend so much time at work that it should be fun. And so I've always enjoyed laughing. You know, I wanted laughter to be in my senior team room. I wanted my executives to have fun. And uh, so I think my sense of humor uh, has I love that. served me well. Yes, I love that. That's very yeah. important. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah oh, Lee. Thank it was a you. pleasure. This book is wonderful. I am Deborah Lee. Can I it's hold a, it yes, one more time? Okay. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a great book. It's a great thank read. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be on the route.